All right. See everyone's back in their seats. It's four o'clock and we're ready to go with our last session of the day, which is a little different than the sessions we've seen so far. We have a panel discussion about implementing harmonized regulations. What are some of the benefits? And what are the challenges? To moderate this session, we are fortunate to welcome the regional director for the ICAO Asia and Pacific office in Bangkok, Mr. Arun Mishra. Prior to assuming his current position in February 2014, Mr. Mishra was the director general of civil aviation of India. He has also served as the permanent representative of India on the ICAO Council from 2009 to 2012. And so when it comes to harmonization, he has a lot of experience. May I invite Mr. Mishra to the platform, please? Thank you for the kind introduction, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's an onerous task to moderate the last session of the day, and uh, I will try to be uh, short and interesting, but this is a very interesting panel. Um, so far, the whole day, you have uh, had some very uh, informative sessions on global perspectives and challenges. You had the uh, session on need for categorization of unmanned aircraft operations to respond to the rapid expansion of the industry. And lastly, before the coffee break, we had the uh, evolution of IKO RPAS regulatory framework and SAPs and related shared experience and strategies to establish uh, transitions to uh, regulatory development and implementation. Uh, the harmonization of regulations and procedures is, of course, vital to all aviation operations. Uh, due to the rapid emergence of this technology, UVA regulations are still embryonic, and heterogeneity of national rules and varying levels of implementation can be observed. We can say that legislation and policy making is lagging way behind the technology. Common problems with UV UAV aviation regulations include flight approvals and poorly documented administrative processes that limit the desired flexibility and impede the widespread utilization of the technology. However, some national aviation authorities and international organizations are already moving to modernize the first wave of regulations. They seek to accommodate user demands and recent technological developments while still among uh, aiming to maintain safe operations as to third parties on the ground. RPAS regulations are subject to national legislation and focus upon three key aspects. Targeting the regulated use of airspace by RPAS as they pose a serious threat for manned aircraft. Secondly, setting operational limitations in order to ensure uh, appropriate flights. And tackling administrative procedures of flight permissions, pilot licenses, and data collection authorization. Achieving a broad, safe, and swift integration of RPA of all sizes into a non-segregated airspace requires an enhanced coordination between the numerous entities as well as different activities involved, regulatory, research and development, and other measures. It's also obvious that achieve, achieving a common regulatory framework covering RPA of all sizes and all types of operation would be an ideal end state. Since not all key technologies required for RPA to fly in non-segregated airspace are today mature and standardized. It is a common understanding that the insertion of RPA in airspace will be gradual and evolutionary. That is initially restricted air access under specified conditions and subsequent alleviation of the restrictions as soon as technology, regulation, and societal acceptance progress. Achieving the full integration of all types of RPAs require the development of appropriate regulations in three essential domains of airworthiness, flight crew licensing, and air operations. These are essential prerequisite safety requirements for insertion into non-segregated airspace. It is imperative that the regulatory framework should not 
simply replicate the system put in place for manned aviation, but must therefore be proportionate, progressive, risk-based, and rules must express objectives that will be complemented by industry standards. The regulatory framework must be an enabler and not an impediment. Hence, striking the right balance between innovation and societal concerns about safety, environmental protection, privacy, and security. As is the case with, for example, ICAO's NX2 provisions of the rules of air, NX6 provisions for aircraft operations, and NX11 provisions for air traffic management, together with their related plans and guidance materials. The document of ICAO standards and recommended practices and global guidance currently being undertaken by the ICAO Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems Panel and the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Advisory Group in cooperation with regional bodies formed under ICAO and other stakeholder groups is the first important step in providing all administrations, ANSPs, airspace users, and critically, uh, the operators of unmanned aircraft systems to the maximum extent possible a common framework of rules and procedures to ensure common understanding of the issues, challenges, and the needs for the safe and equitable access to airspace for all airspace users. The work of harmonizing and then implementing regulations and procedures in all fields of aviation is supported by regional programs. In the field of unmanned aircraft systems, the Asia-Pacific Unmanned Aircraft Systems Task Force is working to develop regional guidance for regulations, education, and safety data analysis for US. Further, it's not only important that we develop a framework of harmonized regulation, but that we also consider how we can best support their harmonized implementation. In this session, we have a set of distinguished panelists with wide spectrum of experience and these experts will provide information on and discuss the benefits and challenges related to implementation of harmonized regulations for the operation of RPAS. I would first like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Hao Liu, Chair of the ICAO Asia Pacific Unmanned Aircraft Systems Task Force. He works closely with us. Professor Hao Liu works as Deputy Director of National Research Center of ATM Law and Standard of China and the director of Institute of Aviation Law and Standard, uh, Bai Hang University. To promote and facilitate the new emerging technology in aerospace operation, such as US, RPAS, suborbital flight, and very high level operation near space operation, Professor uh, Liu works actively as the chair of the ICAO Asia Pacific US Task Force, the vice chair of JARUS. Uh, Chair of Legal Subgroup of ICAO, UNOSA, Space Learning Group. Besides the work on emerging new operations, Professor Liu is also involved in the air and space legislation and policy making in China. He is a member of the drafting committee of aviation law, regulation on airspace, regulation on UAS, regulation on the promotion of civil aviation industry, etc. I would like uh, request Dr. Liu to give his opening remarks. Okay, thank you. Uh, since we are having this event in Chengdu, please allow me for the first part to speak my mother language, which is also official language of ICAO. Because uh, we don't have a group, PPT 我想五分钟的时间进行仪表飞行的遥控驾驶航空器系统
或者它的运营人跨国境的去转移，那这些问题如何去解决？这就需要我们有一个机构能够对它去做出相应的示范性的立法也好，或者找到其他的这个规范性的解决方案。所以这是第一个原因。那第二个原因是什么呢？呃，即使如果我们把除在管制空运和机场进行仪表飞行的遥控驾驶航空器也考虑在内的话，那么我们还有第二个任务，就是在某一个地区，我们的这个标准和这个建议措施呢，也有可能，因为它是作为一个全球层面的考虑，不可能对某一个地区的所有的特性都能给予充分的考虑。那么在亚太区，我们针对亚太区某一些特定的需求。而在全球层面的这个标准和建议措施还没有完全涵盖到的，我们就需要去给它补遗。所以呢，这应该是第二个层面的原因。而且不仅如此，对于我们的标准和建议措施，包括呃我们的这个手册或者其他的航行程序，地区层面事实上也可以做出超越。这个建议措施的这个补充的，当然也有相应的规则和要求，在我们的这个七零三零号文件的前沿的第二款里边的 B 款和 C 款也有相应的这个要求，我们可以做补充，但是不能破坏这个相应的规则，这是第二个原因。那么第三个原因呢，其实我们应该说，呃，是做这个领先或者是做这个试验了。因为在这里呢，其实我因为今天在四川，我其实特别想讲一句这个引用一句话呢。但是这句话其实不是邓小平讲的，但是呢，却是邓小平一直贯彻落实的。作为中国的改革设计师呢，他一直在践行着一个原则，就是摸着石头过河。那摸着石头过河怎么去理解呢？其实有两点：第一，河一定是要过的，那就意味着。无人驾驶航空器所带来的挑战，我们是不可以回避的，而且要让它很好的服务经济社会的发展，这是一点。那第二点是什么？摸着石头就意味着我们的这个改革还是要考虑稳妥的。好，如果是要稳妥，全球都进行试验，那这个风险是相对来讲比较大的。如果有一个地区，如果有一个国家能够先行先试。把这个经验能够为事件所证明的这个切实可行的经验再分享出来，从国家到地区再到全球，那么可能对于全球的无人驾驶航空器安全和高效有秩序的运行都是有帮助的。呃，我想呢，我就大概讲一下我们之所以设立亚太区的无人驾驶航空器工作组的三个原因。至于说我们做了哪些工作。会有哪些成果？还有如何能够和大家互动起来？呃，我们能有更多的经验的分享，包括加入到亚太区的工作组里边呢？我想后面还会有在这个问答的环节或者其他的环节跟大家去做这个交流。我会我把时间留到后面，谢谢大家。Thank you, Dr. Liu. Uh, though I didn't understand, but I am sure, given your experience and knowledge, uh, it must have been very good. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Christopher Petras. He's a legal officer uh, at IQ headquarters, and uh, he has, uh, where in IQ headquarters, he provides advice and assistance on constitutional, administrative, and procedural matters as well as on problems of international law, air law, commercial law, labor law, and related issues. Prior to joining IQ in 2011, Mr. Petras held a range of professional and leadership positions in the field of international law during a 20-plus year of military career. He holds a master's degree in law from the Institute of Air and Space Law at McGill University. So, Mr. Petras, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you. I thought I'd take uh, um, my time, a few minutes here, just to talk a little bit about the legal work uh, that's going on at ICAO rel relative to unmanned pilotless aircraft. And in sitting through the sessions that have gone on so far, um, it was uh, interesting and, and for myself pleasant to hear um, how so many of the principles that we've been working on um, for years are reflected in the presentations that you're hearing uh, today about the regulatory framework. Um, and uh, I think it's important to sort of, we, we hear um, in ICAO in different meetings and, and from the legal bureau that there's a sense that the technical work of ICAO is pro progressing on this issue on unmanned pilotless aircraft, but that the legal work is not. And um, I, I think if, if uh, more people would see the presentations like you all have seen today, you'd see that they would realize that the, the regulatory work that ICAO is doing has been up till now both technical and legal. And it begins from the speakers, from the Secretary General and a number of the other speakers that have mentioned, that have talked about that um, unmanned aircraft are aircraft within the meaning of the definition in Annex 7 of the Chicago Convention. It extends to um, the application of Article 8, how we apply that of the convention to pilotless aircraft, um, emphasizing, emphasizing not only that they are aircraft, but that the meaning of pilotless aircraft within the context of Article 8 means that it is an aircraft without a pilot on board. So when you heard in the last panel the speakers talking about um, the regulatory framework for licensing, um, that is in part a, a, a result, an outcome of that determination that when, when uh, um, we define a pilotless aircraft as not having a pilot on board and then within the, that also extends to Article 32 of the convention, that the remote pilot is not a pilot under the terms of Article 32. So we have, a, we have the uh, need to create a new uh, licensing uh, scheme for remote pilots. And uh, um, so I say that not just out of, out of pride or ego in, in that the work that the legal bureau is doing, but as one of the speakers um, pointed out, the importance of a uh, kind of unification of thought and prioritization in this area. And, and, and so I think that um, the way the uh, um, technical work and legal work, the regulatory framework, reflects the fact that ICAO has that unification of thought, both within um, the technical bureaus, the Air Navigation Bureau, the Air Transport Bureau, and um, the legal bureau with how it's um, proceeding. Some other issues, uh, just to, I noted, uh, that were, would have uh, been worth mentioning. Um, onboard documentation for ARPES, Certificate of Airworthiness, uh, recognition I mentioned before of certificates and licenses. Um, all of these are issues that are being um, the regulatory work, the, the um, standards and recommended practices are being formulated within the uh, working groups of the ARPAS panel, but they have as their underpinnings the legal work that's been done at ICAO to help define how the convention will be applied or should be applied to pilotless unmanned aircraft. Um, more recently, some more specific work that's been going on that, that you may or may not be familiar with. I, I guess there's two um, things that I would want to highlight. One would have been, one would be the, um, the study on liability re related to RPAS. Um, the 38th session of the assembly in 2013 had called for research to identify um, remotely piloted aircraft liability issues. And the study of legal issues relating to remotely piloted aircraft was then 
added to the legal, um, the work program of the ICAO Legal Committee. After uh, that was reported to the ICAO Council, a study on remotely piloted aircraft systems liability was um, ordered by the Council. And then in, 20, 000, uh, in, t in 2015, the 36th session, at the 36th session of the Legal Committee, the Secretariat reported on that liability study, where it was concluded that while ARPAS will expose a new evidentiary landscape, vis-a-vis -vis liability for aircraft damage caused by aircraft, uh, we, the conclusion of the study was that the current liability regime was adequate to accommodate ARPAS technology. And again, it's an example of how going forward those um, legal findings will help guide um, the framework, the regulatory framework uh, um, that will be built. Uh, the second, I think, other major development I'd want to uh, emphasize is the recent establishment of a legal committee working group on, um, on unmanned pilotless aircraft issues. Um, we had also, out of the 36th session of the legal committee, uh, the committee asked for a survey of member states to gather information about national legal regimes of um, ARPAS legislation and to identify other potentially relevant international legal issues. That um, secretariat survey was conducted over the course of 2016 and 2017. Remarkably, we had uh, 61 respondents to the survey. It's about a third of ICAO membership. So it was a very, uh, um, there was a very enthusiastic, positive response from member states. Um, but still, of the, of the issues that states identified and issues that they wanted ICAO to um, undertake, there was no urgent need for new treaties or protocols. And when that was reported at the 37th session of the Legal Committee, which just took place last week. And so out of that, there was a uh, uh, recommendation or a decision, rather, I should say, by the uh, Legal Committee to establish a working group of the Legal Committee that would look at uh, um, international legal issues related to unmanned pilotless aircraft. So we now have, as of Friday, um, a body which is known as the Working Group to address international legal aspects of unmanned pilotless, air, pilotless aircraft operations and integration into civil aviation. And on Friday, so just, just a couple days ago, um, there were terms of reference established uh, for, that, uh, for that working group. And it will be, um, the objective will be to consider legal issues and identify solutions within the framework of ICAO's ongoing work uh, for consideration by the legal committee relative to unmanned pilotless aircraft operations and their integration into civil aviation. Um, the scope of work that was established for the, uh, for the working group, it has a, a rather broad mandate um, for, there were four main uh, areas, uh, topics. The first being um, looking at RPAS, remotely piloted aircraft um, issues. The second was to consider um, those issues related to um, what we're referring to as UAS, and the um, small UAS and the application issues that might relate to the application of the Chicago Convention. Thirdly, uh, was a broader topic that tried to encompass um, newly emerging issues, issues that might come, that we don't know exist now, but in the years ahead. And then the fourth area was as necessary to um, look at our treaty systems and if any uh, changes or uh, updates or interpretations were needed to um, consider those as well. So we'll have that work um, um, beginning uh, shortly, and it's anticipated that the, me that the meetings of that group will coincide with the RPAS panel so that the, um, so that the legal representatives of states that will be participating will have the benefit of the of the um, technical work that's going on in the panels, again, to, um, um, to keep them consistent.
Thank you, Christopher. Um, I didn't know I was work I'm working in IQ. I didn't know all this work is going on in the legal bureau. So it's very interesting to know all this and very heartening to know that the legal bureau as well is working hand in hand with the technical air navigation bureau uh, to deal with this problem. So uh, I don't know. I was wondering, you know, throughout the day I've been listening to various nice uh, speeches and uh, <clears throat> about uh, pilot licensing, uh, remote pilot licensing, the issues related to that, what kind of licensing. But there is one important piece of the puzzle which uh, we have not addressed and that is uh, the air traffic controllers. I'm sure there are a lot of air traffic controllers in this room and uh, how the air traffic controllers will these deal with this new entity in the uh, controlled airspace. Uh, in this context, we have uh, our next speaker, uh, Ms. Kate Madden, Aeronautical Service Officer from Civil Aviation Authority of New Zealand. Kate uh, works for the Civil Aviation Authority of New Zealand as an ATS specialist. Prior to this, she was an air traffic controller for the New, New Zealand ANSP Airways with operational experience at Auckland International Airport, followed by a role in the ATS policy and standards. As part of her role, Kate supports New Zealand's ongoing work considering US development and integration specifically related to air traffic management and UTM. Kate joined ICAO UAS advisory group last year. She also represents New Zealand at the ICAO air traffic management subgroup of the Appenberg. So Kate, like to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you. So I thought I'd start this more uh, this afternoon by discussing where New Zealand's come in the journey around RPAS. As most states, one of the emerging issues and early issues was actually focused around small UAS rather than the large ones. So, like most states, we implemented a, a rule that covered that environment, um, particularly around small UAS below 25 kgs, below 400 feet, and requirements around an aerodrome or controlled airspace. As every other state has found, um, that only covers one small part of the market, but really the emerging issue is around larger RPAS, how it's going to work with an airspace within, with other aircraft, and how to keep everyone within the system safe. We didn't know where the future was going or what it would look like, what technologies would develop, so a second rule part was put into New Zealand, uh, part 102, and it was thinking ahead to larger, more complex but there were no SARPs, there were no standards that we could follow. So it was a performance-based rule that allowed us to adapt. It's less prescriptive than what some other states have happened, but it allowed New Zealand to move forward and adapt to emerging technologies that have um, come into our state. So through these new concepts of operation and developments of types of unmanned aircraft, uh, we have actually been able to accommodate Except as these new aircraft come in, we face ongoing challenges. How will we integrate them with the other aircraft? What separation standards do we need? Other, if you're running two aircraft down final, can you keep them three miles apart? Or really do we need to take into account the extra issue of the C2 link between the aircraft and the pilot and whether we need to put more space in, for example? So the CAA have uh, together a cross-functional group of people considering the challenges that arise um, and consider the impacts not just on aircraft and pilots but actually on the aviation system because as we all know, it is a system. If you change one thing in one part, you can potentially break something in another part of the system. So we have a good small group of people and we uh, constantly work together However, New Zealand can't do this alone. We might be a small nation at the bottom of the Southwest Pacific, but that also means that we have international aircraft coming in and out of our airspace. So 
so we also need to align with the international regulations. Uh, how does New Zealand do this? Well, we do our best to join and contribute to the various panels and, and groups. We have um, myself on the small UAS advisory group. We have a representation on the RPAS panel. Uh, within the Asia Pacific region, uh, there's a small, uh, sorry, a UAS certification working group, which is a group of regulators who've got together to share information. So in terms of the harmonization, to remain international in terms of our operation, we also have to be part of that international community. Thank you, Kate, for sharing with us your experience in New Zealand. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Katalin Radu. Katalin Radu is a Deputy Director of the Air Navigation Bureau at ICAO, in charge of aviation safety and has been in this role since September 2014. He has held a number of executive and managerial positions in the Romanian Ministry of Transport and at the European level with about 20 years experience in aviation safety and international aviation organizations. He also served as president of uh, European Civil Aviation Commission as well as vice president of Eurocontrol and ECAC's focal point for safety matters. Catalin graduated in aeronautical engineering from the Polytechnic University in Bucharest and trained at Supero in Toulouse, uh, specializing in aerospace engineering. He also holds a degree in international relations and European studies with a specialization in public administration management. He began his career with, uh, in the airworthiness field with the Romanian Civil Aviation Authority in 2006, becoming head of accident investigating authority within the Ministry of Transport and in May 2007, Director General of Romanian Civil Aviation. He has received several awards, among others the title of Dr. Honoris Causa in 2011 and Medal the Aeronautic in 2013. So, Catalin. Thank you, Aaron, for the presentation and introduction, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, a little bit m less than one year ago, when we came first, I came first in Chengdu, I discovered uh, this uh, fantastic venue and I say, wow, what uh, will be to, to organize here something like a, a, a event that will, will put together people from all around the world and uh, the, the Chinese uh, industry and regulators to try to see how we can evolve uh, this, uh, this uh, beautiful uh, uh, new approach of, of uh, aviation in the world. And we ended up uh, in this building, uh, and I want to thank the, the, the government of China and the organizers for uh, doing this possible, because for us, for all of us, it's important to, to have the opportunity to uh, discover a little bit more what's happening uh, in different parts of the world, in the same time preserving the global uh, concept. So, um, speaking about the, the standardization and the implementation of standards, uh, you saw uh, earlier our colleagues um, uh, gave you some, some uh, ideas on how in ICAO we are uh, making a regulation, how we do standards and uh, how we are trying to, to uh, keep the, the global approach on, on uh, harmonized uh, standards. In terms of implementation, we have some challenges because the focus of the organization in the beginning was towards producing standards. But how we can better manage to implement those standards, it's, it's a totally different story. And we can see that at the global level, we have a, a rate of implementation of only 65, 66% which is not uh, a huge one, but on the other hand, doesn't necessarily reflect the performance of aviation, of classic aviation, if I can say. Because look, last year, uh, in terms of, of performance, of uh, safety performance, we had only 50 fatalities for 4.1 billion passengers transported, which is huge in terms of performance. However, in the next 15 to 20 years, the traffic will double, will triple here in China, uh, and from our point of view, uh, we have this part of the, the, the challenge. But on the other hand, we have the impact of new technologies. And here is where the ARPAS and all the new, uh, the impact of new technologies is coming. And we need to be able to really cope with the future. So in terms of implementation in the IKEA framework, a part of the standardization uh, part, we have built uh, the so-called global plans. 
Global uh, Air Navigation Plan and Global Aviation Safety Plan. The two plans are reflecting the targeted uh, uh, focus uh, for states, region, and uh, at the global level on what are the, the challenges that we have and where the, the states uh, should focus in order to better cope with the future of the industry. So practically for the GAMP, uh, Global uh, Air Navigation Plan, uh, we see that the impact of new technology, it's, it's quite big in terms of uh, aviation. Uh, and uh, based on that, uh, it's clear that we need to go in a direction where uh, autonomous, automated system, artificial intelligence, it's well integrated in our day-by-day uh, uh, -day operational uh, uh, capabilities. So practically, the uh, Global Aviation Air Navigation Plan, the GAMP, uh, it's trying to design and to enable the future technology that will, will be present and through this one to uh, allow the, the, the harmonized implementation of these new technologies in the, in the uh, field of aviation. In terms of the GASP, the Global Aviation Safety Plan, uh, this, this plan is representing a set of global uh, targets and uh, indicators that should be uh, followed and focused on and practically states, region, and uh, uh, the industry should uh, try to, to cope and to embrace in their uh, uh, documents uh, the focus on this specific target. Uh, meeting the GASP goals and targets will, will enable the, the, the development of ARPAS because we have on one hand, we have effective implementation of existing standard and provision and future one. But on the other hand, we have the, the focus on how we can better manage the risk. Safety management, uh, it's important in this case, and practically identification of hazards and uh, uh, mitigation of risk, it's one of the important focus of the, the GASP. We also have a focus on infrastructure, what we call infrastructure, operational capabilities, ATM, airport, but also what will be the future of the infrastructure and how this will impact our, uh, our uh, evolution in, in terms of safety. Uh, practically, uh, all this combined with the, with the uh, infrastructure that will allow us to, to use data in a more uh, uh, better way to uh, try to highlight the risk and uh, the capabilities of each and every state, a more flexible approach to implementation that will allow uh, different states with different um, uh, environments to, to implement uh, regulation uh, will give us the opportunity to, to see how at the regional and state level we can better implement whatever we put today as, uh, as a provision in place. So practically the two global plans will uh, uh, allow us the, the framework through which we can uh, put a better focus on, on implementation, a better focus on harmonization and practically allow us to, to, to go further without necessarily making uh, huge changes in the, in the actual environment. It's clear that the whole drone concept um, and uh, ARPAS uh, and uh, high level uh, altitude um, operation will have an impact on, on the aviation and practically we need to be sure that at this level today we have the tools in our hands uh, that will uh, allow us to, to go in this direction. So at the ICAO level, a part of the standardization part, as I said, we have these two global plans that are right now uh, in uh, the new edition of 2020-2022 uh, are, are um, on the table to be uh, endorsed by the Air Navigation Conference next, uh, next month and um, uh, during the assembly next year. And these two uh, global plans uh, have a, a targeted element that will be reflected at the regional level and the state level. So like this, the module that you need to implement uh, at the state level and regional level are clearly defined and you can uh, take advantage of this global perspective on what the, the next uh, uh, aviation will, will go, where, where, what will be the, the next um, uh, future of aviation and how we can tackle in the nice and fashionable manner. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, and thank you for sharing the IQ headquarters plan for uh, the future, especially in the context of the new global aviation safety plan and global air navigation plan, how we integrate our work with that. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, got a brief uh, some uh, introduction from all of us here, and we are 
very much in time. I have about 50 minutes for questions and answers and interaction. Uh, so the way I propose to start is uh, I will ask uh, one question each from all the uh, panelists and then we will have the house asking questions. So for the audience, if they want to ask questions, there are two ways. One is through the app and it comes straight to my iPad and the other is just the old way of raising your hands and someone with a mic will reach you. So my first question is to Dr. Liu. Uh, as uh, chair of the U.S. Task Force, the Asia Pacific Regional Ta U.S. Task Force, uh, you have uh, worked towards uh, harmonization, how you have, how would you think that facilitating this work of harmonization going on in the Asia Pacific region? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I think probably to answer this question, the position as a chair of a U.S. task force is not the right position because we are handling U.S. operations which are the U.S. not flying international IFR in the controlled airspace. But the panels for the implementation, we are implementing the uh, subs for the international IFR APAS. But anyway, I will, since I'm also working in the, in the APAS panel as an advisor, I can put the uh, uh, APAS panel position and also U.S. Uh, task forces position together. Uh, for the implementation, I think we may think from the following perspective. First is to uh, establish the regional procedures uh, for the special authorization because according to Annex 8, we may establish the global solutions, but uh, in this region probably, if we follow the full procedures, that is quite probably time consuming. But in this region, if we could reduce some workload, we could have a regional solution that may give more uh, flexibility, which means we will enable the industry to have uh, more efficient, but uh, will definitely keep the safe standard. This is one point one. For the second point, I has, as I had mentioned, probably in the Asia Pacific region, we could also work on the supplementary procedures. So this could work in, in two different directions. One is to supplementary to the uh, uh, special considerations in this region which are not covered by the international provisions. Secondly, permissionable uh, procedures which are not conflict with international solutions. But definitely we have to follow the rules of the uh, uh, document uh, uh, 7030. This is uh, a second point. And the third one, for the implementation, we need a lot of uh, time on the promotion. So use different ways. Today or this week, uh, the APAS Symposium, the June Enable, the IK Workshop, and Danny has also mentioned for the implementation Annex 1, we will have probably have Annex Y implementation workshop. The workshop, the different uh, symposium, and even some other regional activities, like uh, each time when we have a U.S. task force uh, meeting, we also have one mini seminar. That is good opportunity to let the people, the regulators in SP's operators in this region to get a full awareness of the global solutions and also the practice in different the other areas. So that is a third point. For the first, uh, I think the international cooperation will be very important. In, I just confirmed with Leslie, Asia Pacific is the only region which set up the U.S. task force, but we could still find our counterpart may be uh, uh, wholly match with each other. But in, in Europe, we have uh, uh, IASA. They are wo also working and gave priority for the category A and B in the, in the JARAS language, that is open and specific regulations. So uh, now we are also trying to have one joint event next year 
to, that means we will have a UAS task force meeting and together with one JARS workshop so that lets the uh, deliverables of JARS could also be well absorbed by our colleagues in the Asia Pacific region. And the last one will be the uh, exchange of the successful, probably even not only the successful, but the lessons we have learned in some other regions so that people know which direction has been proved that is uh, could be continue working on in that direction or some other direction. Please do not touch that direction anymore because we have a lesson in some other part. I think these five points could be uh, quite uh, useful for the implementation of the international standard as recommended practice. Thank you. So, Dr. Liu, this was very valuable. Your five points, I'm sure we are taking note of it and we'll share this with everyone and keep that in mind while developing international regulations. I'm also happy to note that uh, Asia Pacific is a very progressive region led by under your leadership. So, uh, Catalina, I have a question for you. Uh, this is regarding harmonization. How important is harmonization to safety oversight? What support can ICO provide to states lacking resources to conduct safety oversight? It's challenging because in terms of safety oversight, uh, we always have uh, uh, an approach that it's not ICAO and not the industry. At the ICAO level, all states and industry come together to design the future standards or to amend the, the actual one. Uh, and to come up with the right uh, regulatory framework that would allow the implementation of new developments in terms of industry. On the other hand, industry is coming and uh, with uh, new developments, with new ideas, and uh, they are putting in place uh, uh, solutions for making more affordable and more uh, uh, easy the life of, of, uh, of people. And at the end, what we both want uh, uh, at in terms of IKEA in industry, is to create the perfect environment where uh, they can, uh, industry can develop new solutions, and we, as uh, as a level of the the, the state, we can implement them uh, and ensure that the the solutions are well defined and will keep the high standards of safety and uh, security in place. The challenge that we have, it's not on the IKEA side or on the industry part. It's tackling the regulator capability to deal with uh, all these new standards and with the new activities that are coming from the industry. So practically, right now, we are trying to see what is the best way forward to allow the, the civil aviation authorities from states to be able to be involved in the certification and oversight of all new activities. Because sometimes the easiest answer is no, we cannot do it this because we don't have the capability to certify these new ideas. But on the other hand, we cannot hamper the development of the industry. So that's why r right now in IKEA we try to, to develop um, a part of the classical system of guidance material, workshops, symposia like this one. We are trying to see how we can better address the capability of states to deal with safety oversight. And it's challenging because if for the classical aviation we have only 66% uh, of uh, effective implementation, uh, we see that there are other players that are making aviation so safe. And one of them is the industry, of course. Uh, they, they put a lot of efforts to, to cope with, with the challenges that the states have in the area of effective implementation. So practically, this mixed, uh, uh, makes a, a little bit better the, the, the performance level of, of, uh, of the industry. However, in terms of new developments, in IKEA, part of, as I said, uh, guidance material, trying to create platforms uh, for sharing uh, of best practices, trying to put in place all these new trainings and, and uh, uh, tools that uh, each and every state will use in order to, to, to implement in their national legislation the regulatory framework of IKEA. Uh, we are trying to see uh, what other mechanisms could exist at the, at the global level. And we saw that, especially for the new technologies, um, there is the capability under the Chicago Convention where the states are, are still uh, maintaining their full responsibility um, to delegate some safety oversight function. And we saw that uh, in terms of, of uh, regional mechanisms, we have already around uh, uh, 20, 30 uh, regional mechanisms globally 
that are uh, their members are more than 160 members in this uh, in this regional mechanism. So practically, if you have the capability to work at the regional level to try to harmonize and to push the harmonization of, of, of regulation, and at the same time to try to get some added value in promoting the safety or delegating safety oversight at the regional level, uh, this will help a lot because, as I said, more than 85% of, of states are part of regional mechanism. So one solution is to try to delegate a, a function. As I said, the Chicago Convention uh, it's, it's in place, so we, we, uh, the state will uh, maintain its full, its full uh, responsibility toward that. But we have the capability nowadays to, to use uh, other uh, uh, states or other uh, regional uh, organization uh, safety oversight capabilities uh, and to, to delegate to them. Uh, in this respect, we start creating, uh, in fact, we created a, a system in, uh, in ICAO called GASOS, uh, which is the Global Safety Oversight uh, System. And right now we are uh, working with uh, a group of experts from all over the world to, to uh, try to explore the possibility of putting this system in place. Uh, the system is trying to uh, put in place a mechanism, it's a voluntary system, put in place a mechanism through which IKEA will start recognizing the, the safety oversight functions of RSOs and state and practically put at the disposal of the states uh, that cannot afford to, to have their own system uh, uh, library, uh, uh, repository of solutions that could be used at the global level. Uh, so those two elements that are right now in place, the, the guidance material, the classical way to address uh, uh, better uh, implementation at the level of the states, but also through the regional mechanism uh, and delegation of function could be the, the future options that we might envisage because once again, the new technology necessitates the, 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 a lot of competency, new competencies uh, in the CAAs and it's not so easy for all the, the, the uh, CAs to have uh, technical capabilities in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, automated systems, uh, cyber threats. So there are a lot of things that should be addressed. And if you don't have the basic uh, capability at the level of the CAA, it's sometimes challenging and you can hamper the development of the industry. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, my next question is to Chris. Uh, Chris, from your experience in ICAO, what do you see as a major legal impediment to the harmonization of regulations and procedures for our class operations across multiple national boundaries and non-sovereign airspace? And a second uh, subset is that, uh, do you foresee uh, any amendment of the Chicago Convention uh, for this kind of meeting these requirements? Because that becomes a very onerous task, uh, going for an amendment of Chicago Convention. Well, it's a um, mini-part um, question. It brings a lot of thoughts. Um, I think it's ironic that I think that um, closer. Okay, there we go. Um, I think that uh, one of the interesting challenges. Um, and we, you hear it repeated here by a number of the speakers, just um, getting um, a full embrace of the concept of all unmanned aircraft as aircraft has been a challenge, interestingly. Um, and, and I think in part that the reason behind that is, and it may be a, another part of the uh, challenge, I, I don't know if it goes to the to the um, harmonization of regulation, but when you talk about possible amendment of the Chicago Convention, it's to consider, I, I think that, and, 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 and it's both on the legal side and on the technical side, that we are really lucky, I think, as, as a lawyer and, and as someone who studied the Chicago Convention, we're really lucky to have a treaty document um, that the drafters of which were really prescient in, in putting it together. And, and one of the speakers touched on this before, that when they were um, drafting Article 8 of the convention, they had in mind, there, were, um, there was a, already, by 1944, a long history of um, remotely uh, or unmanned aircraft, and including remotely piloted aircraft. And I think sometimes 
we tend to forget that. And if, and if, we, if we take time and to understand that the way the convention was put together, that those that, that remotely piloted aircraft were actually considered in the drafting of its terms, the, the other pieces of the convention come together quite nicely. And, and, and you can kind of, it, it, there's a, a, um, a logical structure to it. And so I tend to think, I tend to think no. I tend to think that we don't have to. In general, I mean, there, there, there could be something that, um, as I mentioned with our uh, working group that is going to be looking at um, possible, uh, the potential for amendments or, or interpretation. There could be things that, you know, off the top of my head, uh, with jet lag and everything I'm not thinking of, but I, I tend to think, no, and, and a lot of questions, we've had discussions um, recently uh, w when we talk about, uh, uh, for example, application of of article 3 bis when we talk about um, pilot loops aircraft and when when there's questions like that i think it's important to be able to distinguish between what what is a lawyer we might call like the evidentiary landscape related to the application of a provision versus the scope of the provision and when we talk about uh, and i'll give I'll, I'll use article 3 bis as an example um, when we talk about a provision there with article 3 this that um, um, proposes that states shall refrain from the use of force um, against an aircraft, and then the question becomes: Well, would a would a remotely piloted aircraft have that? Uh, would that apply, or or a UAS would that apply? Because we see new types of problems or threats that might be associated with a with a um, unmanned or piloted aircraft, as opposed to when the provision was written, um, a, a piloted aircraft perhaps with passengers on board. And, but you can, when you, if, you, if you start with Article 8 and the application of it and you, and you consider the treaty in total, you can see that it would, um, it would apply, but there was nothing in the right drafting of Article 3 bis that um, would take away the ability let's say, of a state to use an electronic measure to against a um, unmanned uh, aircraft or a pilotless aircraft. Um, that would not be inconsistent with that provision. And, and in fact, the concerns of Article 3 bis about the possible lo loss of life that could result from the use of force against a manned aircraft wouldn't be as big a concern. So again, it, it, there's a certain eloquence, I think, to the Chicago Convention that I would say it probably doesn't um, necessitate amendment, but uh, that's just one example that we, we had a discussion of recently when we were um, at the legal committee. Um, uh, as to, you know, the biggest problem with uh, um, harmonization, it, I, I, think it's, I think it's the, the quickly evolving um, uses, the, the technologies, the application of unmanned aircraft. I think the pace at which um, these things are happening is in part, I think, the biggest challenge for harmonization because there's, um, as, as new uses, um, new technologies are, are coming into development very quickly, there is new needs in the regulatory area um, that haven't been um, perhaps anticipated and so um, trying to harmonize those across all states when you know there's different needs. We we t discussed at the uh, legal committee the issue of operations, some operations over the high seas, for example, and not all states are impacted by those and and their their new developments. So I think trying to harmonize that that's what I think is the biggest challenge is the the high pace of um, introduction of new technology and applications of of ARPAS and UAS. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for this explanation. Uh, one of the things uh, which is important is uh, in regular harmonization is that uh, there has been a regulatory vacuum because ICO has not been able to move quickly. So there are other states are moving in and different paces. And unless we move in quickly, uh, we will uh, have a multitude of regulations which will be difficult to harmonize at a later stage. But if we start with a building block now, 
uh, then uh, there are many states who have not yet started this work, but they will not have a problem. They will just ride onto the bandwagon. Well, I think you're right. But, you know, I, I've used this analogy, though, and I think it is um, relevant to this area of, of, um, of um, UAS ARPES as well. Um, and, and, it, and it basically suggests that uh, while it is um, necessary to respond quickly um, to assist with harmonization, at the same time, some degree of patience, and I, and I pointed out, like, for example, with the automobile, um, when the automobile automobile first came into existence, it took many forms. Um, uh, uh, there weren't uh, uh, all 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 states in the world didn't have the same um, technology in terms of roadways um, and the building of roads and so forth. And it and it took time um, for the technology to mature. But you notice, uh, you know, when it finally did mature, all automobiles kind of around the world basically looked the same. And it, but it wasn't until after the Second World War that we actually looked at some kind of uh, um, international regulation, say, for example, to establish uniform signage around the world and those kind of things. And, and it, and it might have been it might have been premature if at, in, in the early 1900s um, that kind of international regulation was too aggressive. It, it, it allowed holding off a little bit or having a, having a patient uh, approach, some degree of patience, allowed um, the, the market to drive technology. It, it, it helped to not exclude technological developments. And then once the technology m was mature, we saw the development of some international regulation that made sense. And so I think there has to be a balance, I guess is what I'm saying. Now we move to Kate. Uh, Question for you is, you know, New Zealand, uh, despite being a small state, has shown very progressive action to deal with this problem of regulating the U.S. And uh, what I would like to understand from you is that based on your experience, you have been very much an active part, taken an active part in the whole process. Uh, how would you advise the smaller states, uh, you know, they are now embarking on this, what challenges they face? and what, uh, you know, hindsight wisdom you can share with them. Thank you. Uh, as you're aware, um, New Zealand is a small state and our resources, like other small, small states, are not the same as they are in larger states. The, because of that, we uh, do look to international standards as well as what's happening in other parts of the world to inform us on how we can develop and learn and then implement that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, in terms of some of the challenges, um, aviation is a system. We can't just go off and do our own thing because then our aircraft or other aircraft coming into New Zealand, it won't be aligned and that's where we add risk to the system. Um, as we've already discussed here, the development of the SARTs has been rather slow moving. Um, this is where the risk-based approach assisted New Zealand in moving forward and considering new technology. So the, I did mention this at the beginning, but the performance-based rule, um, whilst it still has a minimum level of safety, it allowed, allows New Zealand to pull in, I guess, parts of other rules where required. So, for example, one of the challenges that has come up is traditionally aircraft run on fuel. So, how do you deal with an aircraft running off a battery? Um, you have fuel requirements, how much holding fuel does a pilot need to ensure they have on the aircraft? What backup battery system you might have? These are one of the examples that, from our airworthiness team. So, um, in terms of the challenges, it's looking at what's actually already in the system to support you that you can then apply to this new technology of RPAS. Because whilst we talk about these new technologies, in effect, there are some similarities with what we already have. It's just finding the similarities at the same time. Um, one of the other challenges is um, probably in the smaller space, but differentiating between the professional UAV operators and the amateurs with no aviation knowledge. So as a state, how can we allow the professionals to push technology and fund new and novel ways of using um, that technology in potentially a safer way? 
that we can then take that knowledge and apply it back to manned aviation as well. Because whilst we think about this new technologies coming in with our pairs, actually there's lessons we can learn from that and apply it back to manned aviation. Um, additionally, we have a very uh, pilot-centric set of rules. All our rules are based around a pilot being in the aircraft. And from the discussions we had earlier today, and you'll notice they talked about that where there is a review of every annex that's basically impacting every part of aviation. Well, as on a state level, we have to consider the rule set that we have and what that new rule set needs to look like to incorporate both manned and unmanned aviation. Um, one of the other challenges is the existing players in the system. So uh, for those that don't know New Zealand, uh, we're a small country, we've got quite diverse terrain, um, and we have a very vocal and large general aviation community. So whilst we have international um, airports, we also have another part of the system to consider. So getting them engaged and on board and basically, as they say, taking them on the journey as well because the effect of RPAS is actually, the, I guess at the beginning a lot of people thought that RPAS will just slip into the system and conform, but actually it's going to change how we do things. So some of our old ideas of, um, for example, from Annex 2, the rules of the year, the right-of-way rules, well, how does that work when you don't actually have a pilot sitting in the aircraft? Is there an impact to manned aviation and how their expectations are when they get to that situation and how, it, how it's going to work out? What, what can they expect of the unmanned aircraft? What can you expect of a manned aircraft? So I, I guess it goes back to one of the, the statements I made at the beginning, aviation's a system. You can't just slot something in and, ex and expect it's not going to affect anything else we have to consider the wider group and it's important to engage people of different experience and backgrounds in the conversation so that we maintain a safe and efficient system. Well, thank you, Kate. Uh, it's a very interesting point about, uh, you know, our work is not only to create space for new players and new stakeholders who are coming in, but also look at the how to deal with the existing people in the system, the existing players. And uh, since we are going to unify this. Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, from the audience on the iPad. And I would also encourage if anyone would like to do the conventional way, I mean, you can raise your hands and we will identify you. So the first question I will ask uh, Dr. Liu. And this is regarding uh, what is the role of industry in harmonization? Okay, uh, the role of the industry is very, very important for the harmonization because the harmonization is served for the interest of the industry. So that is the beginning. And industry will also working together with the regulators, with the ASPs, for the promulgation of the regulation at global, regional, and domestic level. So they are involved, as far as I know, it seems now, this time, for the unmanned aviation, the involvement of the industry is even better than the manned aviation. So uh, they're working together for the harmonization. And the industry says now, aviation is global, and unmanned aviation is even more so uh, the industry is now also helping the international harmonization. I could say so many familiar faces. I see them in Montreal, I see them in Europe, I also see them in Bangkok or some other uh, places of the world. I know they're not only travel for this event, they will also bring back the ideas we have had here and will, these ideas will also be helpful for the harmonization in different regions of this world. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, two questions which are related, but I'll do, I'll ask one from Catalin and one from Kate. Uh, the first one to Catalin, uh, is uh, global harmonization really possible? Given that regulatory oversight capabilities and that advancement in RPS technology 
vary so greatly from country to country. So basically, your point you are making about gasos and all that. Um, I think that uh, there are challenges related to harmonization, and we see this uh, each and every day, not only for the uh, new technologies, but also for uh, whatever aviation means to, to uh, so far. Uh, different states have different uh, environments, and uh, depending on their capability to deal with, with uh, aviation, they have different level of implementation. Uh, in terms of uh, full harmonization, by signing the Chicago Convention, uh, all states committed to, to fully implement the standard and recommended practices of ICAO, with the exception of, of filing some differences. But a part of that, uh, each and every state committed to do this. So practically, this is the, our final goal, our final target, to have 100% effective implementation, even this, we know that it's a kind of aspirational target. That's why in, in the context where we have the doubling of traffic and new technology arriving, um, it's quite challenging to say that, okay, uh, after so many years of aviation, we still have only uh, two-thirds uh, of, of, of states fully implemented the, uh, globally the, the, the standard and recommended practices. So how we can better manage the future? Because, okay, if we are okay in terms of safety today, what will be when we will have all these new challenges? So that's why we are trying to, to look into the capability of states to work in a more uh, uh, integrated manner and trying to go to the regional level and uh, to try to find ways to, to benefit of pooling of experts and uh, harmonize approaches to, to uh, safety and uh, air navigation. And we see this uh, in some different parts of the world. Uh, in EASA, for example, we see that uh, the, the agency is working for the benefit of, uh, of their members. Uh, in Latin America, we have some mechanism, regional mechanism, where um, uh, they, they try to implement the uh, so-called LAR, the Latin American regulation, aviation regulation. Uh, and it's working very well. We see the high level of implementation where uh, states are going uh, to a regional mechanism and try to get something back. Um, however, it's, it's always a challenge because some of the regional mechanisms, even if we have uh, in the last 10-15 uh, years, we have uh, the creation of this uh, so-called RSO, Regional Safety Oversight Organization, and their sub-mechanism, the COSCAP, um, we see that uh, sometimes not all of them uh, are, are working properly. So uh, what we try to put in place, it's a mechanism through which um, we can assess the capability of uh, regional safety oversight organization or regional mechanism to uh, provide some safety oversight, uh, the standardized uh, model of, of uh, the, the level of ICAO, and practically to try to push the harmonization. If all the states today, member of this regional mechanism, will use uh, this regional mechanism in different area that they are uh, providing services, uh, the effective implementation globally will, will go towards, uh, uh, will raise by, by 15, 20% just by making this big step forward to, to let uh, states benefiting of, of the use of this mechanism. But it's not easy because we have different challenges. Uh, harmonization, as I said, it's the, the final goal and uh, we are trying to, to put in place the best mechanism to address it because at the end what we want is to make sure that all states are benefiting from, from the, the, the uh, added value of aviation. Thank you. Kathleen, uh, a similar question for you, Kate. Uh, it's not all states have the resources to engage in international harmonization activities. So what can these states do? In terms of um, international harmonization, I think we already see the benefits through manned aviation. If I consider, I'll use an analogy, but if I consider my journey from New Zealand to Chengdu on Saturday, I flew from Wellington to Auckland to Hong Kong to Chengdu. I was on an Airbus and a Boeing. Um, we flew over Australia, who is a different air traffic control system to what we have in New Zealand. But what it is, is the protocols and systems that sit behind all of that technology and, and the operators. So what can states do? States can make themselves not, uh, aware of and learn from what other states are doing. Learn from the SARPs. See how, what works in other states, the lessons learnt, and how they can apply it. 
But probably more importantly is if we have states going down different paths, you know, one goes that way and one goes that way, when we get to the international environment, it's not going to work. And that's where the lessons of globalisation already in manned aviation need to be applied back to unmanned aviation. And whilst for, um, I guess, new players in the aviation market, um, they may not have that history and knowledge of where aviation has come from, but um, it's probably a good opportunity to understand that we have such a safe and efficient system is because we have learnt from each other's countries, we've learnt different ways of doing things. If an accident happens in one state, that lesson's pulled into ICAO, it changes um, what's sitting in the SARPs or, um, or, or guidelines, which then everyone can learn from and apply, and ma unmanned aviation is no different. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have come to the end of the questions, which I have got. So I would encourage, we still have some time, encourage some questions from the audience. So it seems uh, everyone wants, had a long day and they want to go now. So, but I have one question, uh, which is, I want to, this is actually not a question, it's a doubt for me. Uh, when we talk about harmonization, uh, we are, I mean, for me, there are two levels of harmonization. Uh, one is a very simple to understand, and that is uh, harmonize the rules and regulations of national aviation. So every state should have the rules which are harmonized with other states, a standard. The other is uh, slightly complex to understand, uh, is are we harmonizing the regulation of manned aviation with unmanned aviation. I mean, who is harmonizing with whom? Uh, because we are developing now new st standards uh, for unmanned aviation. And how uh, are we going to harmonize each or there will be distinct entities. Uh, harmonization is just referring to the national legislation which will be uh, standard for everyone. Okay, when, when we start to talk about a harmonization, that means we have a difference. So uh, you had mentioned harmonization between uh, among the national legislation. So for some countries who are still lacking of the resources to uh, the, draft a new regulation for the AMAN aviation, so I, I, when, when, when Kate got to the question, my, I just got a one word, that's a transplant. So got to uh, just follow the implement the international subs or some countries who have the similar situation to transplant that regulation to your country. But if we have several countries, they have the capability for the regulation, then we need uh, the harmonization. Then the, glo uh, the, the ICAO will be the fantastic platform to harmonize this domestic regulation. But as I had mentioned, Regionally, you could parallelly harmonize with at the global level, but uh, still have the regional approach. Or you may harmonize in your region, be advanced of the uh, ICAO, that is global level. For the manned and the unmanned part, I thinking probably we will not use the word of harmonization. We use the word from, uh, we, we have the keywords, Leslie has used that before, that is from segregation to accommodation, and now we're changing to the phase of uh, integration. So let the unmanned and manned aviation to share the airspace, fly safe, secure, and efficient. It is not, quite, according to my understanding, it is not a question of harmonization, it is an integration problem. Thank you, Dr. Liu. This was very helpful. Uh, I would ask uh, the panel if you have anything to mention or say in addition to what you said. Christopher? Well, I, would, I, I think there, part of the answer to your 
question about the two types of um, of harmonization is that it, it is in a way um, reflective of the technology because on the one hand um, the on the one hand, the unmanned um, aircraft is an evolution of manned aviation. So you're moving the, they're, they're going, you know, we're, we're, it, it wasn't until I got involved with um, um, working unmanned uh, aircraft issues that I understood the, um, the uh, automation that goes on in a manned aircraft, like how much of flying a manned aircraft is automated now. And so when you realize that you see that it's sort of an evolution that you're going from piloted aircraft to aircraft that are highly automated but with still um, crew accrued by uh, people to an evolution to an aircraft that won't have a, a human crew maybe. Um, and, and, but then on the other hand, uh, the other part of it, the other part of that uh, harmonization is kind of a new technology and you think of like the difference say between uh, the, the evolution of the telephone to a cell phone versus uh, maybe like a tablet. Um, it's not, the tablet doesn't really necessarily replace the computer like the cell phone replaced the old phone. It's a different application. And, and, and so in some ways, it, so it's depending on the technology, the harmonization will be different. Thank you. I think for harmonisation, uh, one of the ways that the current aviation system works is on a, I guess on a concept of predictable and consistent. And what that means is that when someone flies from China to New Zealand and they arrive at Auckland Airport, all parts of the system know what to expect of each other. So the pilot knows what the air traffic controllers will do, the air traffic controllers have an understanding of what the pilot will do. If an emergency happens, again, there's a, an, a knowledge in, around the system about what's going to happen next. And I think in terms of harmonization, uh, if we're thinking about integrating manned and unmanned aircraft, that will keep the system working, is it doesn't matter what technologies are in there, whether you have a pilot on board or not on board, whether we get to um, into AI type environments, but in terms of every part of the system, what's predictable and what's consistent? How are they going to interact with each other? And what can be expected when something goes wrong? Because generally that's when we learn our biggest lessons. Um, today I think uh, we are, when we're talking about harmonization, we are looking more how to make sure that the new technologies are not uh, putting, putting in danger the actual uh, system that exists today. So practically, we are trying to adapt and to integrate uh, the, new, the new technologies and new newcomers into the context that we are used to, to, to work. The future could be different because right now with the new automated systems uh, for, for use for delivery drones or the high level, uh, high level altitude uh, um, uh, objects that are there, this uh, will put a pressure on the classical aviation uh, management and especially in the area of air traffic management we can see that uh, in the future we might have some, some pressure coming from, from these uh, new technologies and new approaches to, to deal with, with air traffic management. So practically, I think that, um, as you said, nowadays we are trying not to go into a direction where uh, uh, we need to adapt the actual aviation to the new, but we try to preserve what we have and to, to preserve the high level of, of performance that we have today. While for the future, it's, it's certain that uh, a lot of pressure will come from the newcomers and will end up uh, having a more uh, mixed uh, kind of operation that will, will uh, integrate better the two, the two worlds. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, Dr. Liu? Okay. Well, si since now we still have time, I would like to did some, uh, do some uh, promotion work of our U.S. task force. Uh, you may find all the documents of our U.S. task force on the website of Asia Pacific Regional Office. You may also find the terms of reference. According to our terms of reference, oh, the objective for us is very simple. If I, I just simplify in one sentence, that is from an ATM perspective to support 
the seamless integration of all the other UAS in non-segregated airspace. When we talk about all the other UAS, which means not international IFR APAS, so that is quite a big scope. Uh, probably the challenges are facing by so many member states. That is the scope of our task force. Uh, well, this task force only open to the, the member states and international organization, but the door is not open if you got an invitation from the ICAO regional office. You could also attend the mini seminar and probably the Asia Pacific third meeting. So we will be very happy to get your contribution in the next meeting so that they, I got one question from our moderator, the role of the industry, especially the industry, you could play a very dynamic role to promote the international harmonization, at least in the Asia Pacific region. Well, I would like also encourage some other regions of uh, our member states. Now we are the only one. Probably the counterpart, we could find our counterpart in Europe because they have a very good regional uh, harmonization or regional coordination work. But how about the other regions? If you are facing the similar challenges, if you think the task force in one region will also be helpful, probably you could be our counterpart. But definitely, that is your decision. You may wait because we are kind of a pioneers, but we are probably the rabbit in the laboratory. Nobody knows whether we will provide a positive, successful result or license. You may wait. But if you wait, that means you will be missing the opportunity to contribute to the international community. To, this is a dilemma, but since we are facing quite uh, innovative amount of aviation, why not think different thing openly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for your impassioned speech, promoting everyone to join our task force. Uh, uh, we have come to the end of the panel discussion. Uh, I must say that I really enjoyed this panel, and uh, I would like to thank all our, my fellow panelists uh, for sharing their insight and very interesting observations. Uh, I would now call upon the MC to end the session. Yes, thanks again to our panelists and for, to how for encouraging an active response to the need for harmonization. So we've had a full day since the morning coffee break, we have looked at foundational concepts, categorization. Uh, we followed up with a look at the RPAS regulatory framework and some of the current initiatives that are underway, and we ended off with harmonization. And now I know that there's one thing that stands between you and Hot Pot, and that's me. So I'm going to close for the day, and we'll see everyone here tomorrow um, for the first session uh, of the day. Thank you very much.